with Gabriel Gonzalez Nunez. That's right. Good pronunciation? Yes. Okay. Gabriel, what are you doing these days? Uh, so right now I'm at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, um, and I'm, I'm the Director of Translation and Interpreting Programs. We have a full BA and a full MA, uh, and I have the unfortunate task of administer, administrating these. You mean you don't enjoy it? <laughs> Not the administrative part. Oh, no. okay. <laughs> Somebody has to do it. All yes, right. I just okay. wish it were someone else. So, but you're working with Spanish English? Or do you Spanish have English. So over there, because we're right on the border with Mexico, everything mm -hmm. is Spanish English. Mm -hmm. Bilingual for us means Spanish English. Uh, in our programs, that's, that's what we work with. Okay, great. So we'll go back when you were right. 23, 24, 25. What were you doing then? So I was, at the time I was in law school. Uh, okay, so you're a lawyer. We have to. You're a qualified lawyer. It, yes. Yeah, right, yes. Yeah. And and so, at the time I was in law school at Brigham Young University, and I, to be honest, I wasn't loving my my studies. Um, and so the first year was terrible, and the second year was okay, and I was enjoying it by the third year, and then I graduated. So, <laughs> uh, and so, um, I, I had a BA in translation. And, and I'd done that for a while, but I always knew that I wanted to study more. So you went from translation to law? Yes. Right. Okay. yes. So, you know, I, I was working as a lawyer, as a, sorry, as a translator, and uh, I knew I wanted some sort of, you know, graduate degree. Mm -hmm. And, you know, law is something people do when they, you know, can't see blood. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and so I don't know. I you just, didn't want social justice or something like that? Um, I was hoping to do that with, uh, with my law degree, but then I graduated um, and I ended up, the kind of jobs I was looking for were like working for Indian tribes and, you know, and that kind of thing. And of course, I had no way into those, those circles. Uh, and so then I ended up doing immigration law. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was okay, except it, you know, makes me sound weak emotionally, but it really destroyed me emotionally. Every time I got home, and I was devastated, and I didn't want to talk to anyone, and I didn't want to... Because of the cases? You yes, made? because yeah. um, under U.S. immigration law, once you're in deportation proceedings, the odds that you'll not be deported are infinitesimal. Uh, and so, you know, most of my clients had an uphill battle, and you know, I had... You know, literally, ladies sitting across from me, you know, bawling their eyes out. This is in um, in Utah. In Utah, yes. So, so, so I was even there, in Utah. you get lots of immigration law happening. Yes, I mean, it's not a borderline state. No, you know, no. I mean, right. that's everywhere. In fact, when yeah. I was there in Utah, um, they had a few years previously they had opened an immigration court, uh, and when but by the time I started practicing, it gone from having one judge to having two judges, mm. uh, and I don't know how many they'll have now, but. I, as part of my legal studies, I did a, a, an, an externship is what they call it, but um, I was an intern at the immigration court mm. and the load was just too much for the, for the judge to handle that. Okay. I had a second load. So, yeah, so, so, so you got out of law because of those harrowing experiences? For me, yes. Yeah, okay. And the out that I got was through translation because mm. I was sitting in my office and I got a call. Uh, it was... Um, well, I got a call from the university because they couldn't give out my number, but they said, your old professor is looking for you. Call him. Mm -hmm. And it was my professor from my undergraduate degrees where I'd done uh, translation. And he says, you remember Professor So-and-so? She passed away. Um, and in his words, we need a warm body until we can hire <laughs> someone <laughs> full time uh, that has a PhD and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I said, sure. And everybody thought I was insane because I was giving up a full-time law career to teach part-time translation courses temporarily because yeah. eventually they were going to hire someone else. Um, but it was my out. And then I, I loved it. I really did. Uh, yeah. And so at that point, uh, I talked to, to the professor that had talked to me about going. And I said, well, you know, I want to stay. And he's like, not without your PhD. Um, but... You can go and get your PhD, and then you know maybe there will be something here for you at that point. Then uh, I said, "Great, where should I go?" And he said, "You need to go to Spain and study under Anthony Pym." Who, uh, who was this professor? Daryl Haig. 
Really? Yes. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> That's okay. what he said. Uh, and uh, and so I did. You know. Uh, and and at that. Oh, moment, you did a master's then. Yes. Right. In research training. Yes. And then you went on. Right. So I, I went to Spain and studied under you. Mm-hmm. And then uh, there was this project we, which you told me about because I, I didn't know about it, which was the uh, it was for graduate students or PhD students. Um, and so at that point, I was selected for that project, and that meant me and my family moving to Belgium uh, and working with Rain and Mailers, uh, and that was a lot of fun. And that, for on a personal note, those three years that I spent in Belgium, we still think very fondly of them. Uh, mm. with with my wife um, so yeah so you know I went there and Raina was working with translation policy uh, so you know I had to submit this project as part of my application and uh, I didn't know oh, translation policy what am I, I going to say uh, so all I could think of was doing some sort of legal comparative study um, mm. and that's what I proposed and it got me in uh, and then, but your law training helped you a lot. Yes, of course, of course. I, I couldn't have done it otherwise. I, I, I often think to myself, if I hadn't, because there's a point of uh, in my life where I was thinking, why did I study law uh, if I'm not going to use this? You know, once I decided to get out, so mm-hmm. there's this sort of existential crisis. Uh, it was it was hard work and it was it was really very difficult. Um, and you know money and time and you know so why but looking back that made it possible for me to do my phd in translation studies because mm-hmm. i could bring in my legal training uh and do something which you know i didn't know anything about board view i couldn't do that kind of thing mm-hmm. um but i knew about you know looking up laws and comparing them and how well, to tell find me a bit about and, your doctoral thesis then. so what i did was a a compared to what well, I call it comparative study, but it was a policy study on translation policy in the United Kingdom. Um, so I thought that I'd like to see how this thing trickles down. Uh, and so I started with the broadest thing that I could think of, which was international law. And I looked at, you know, translation under international law or more specifically, anything that has to do with language rights that would derive in translation under international law. Um, and then, you know, move to the national level with the, the British government and, you know, how they take this and apply it or don't apply it. Uh, and then looked at the devolved governments, you know, Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland. Um, and then even down at the municipal level and the hospital level and the courts. And so I sort of went down as, as far down as I could within you know, a certain period of time uh, and looking at how, you know, these policies were created and to some point implemented or not uh, as you move down through these different levels and how a lot of times local policy is a result of impositions from levels above that Mm -hmm. are somewhat removed and then but it's never exactly how it's seen above right there's always some sort of difference that's made on the ground when people actually put this into practice. Did you find anything shocking or that surprised you then? Um, to some extent, no, because I wasn't sure what I was going to find. Uh, but there is definitely a disconnect between the discourse, sort of the, the human rights discourse, mm-hmm. and especially in academia, uh, which is very normative anyway. I mean, it's how things should be, not how things mm-hmm. are. Um, and then what people end up doing. And, and in the UK especially, this isn't everywhere, but in the UK especially, they're very pragmatic about these things. Uh, so it's really about solving the immediate yeah. problem that they have before them, um, among other things. I mean, there's identity politics that come into play and other things, but yeah. Mm. Then you co-edited uh, a book on translation policy. Yes. So then once I graduated, I was hired in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, and, you know, I, I wanted to continue doing these things and I worked on turning my thesis into a book and getting that published. And then Raina and I, she sent me an email. She said, you know, we should really pick up on this and, and continue working on it. Um, so here was this idea of editing a book. Uh, and we thought instead of having sort of an open call for papers for everyone, we'll single out specific people 
from because interdisciplinary was important to us. Yeah. So we'll look for people within translation studies, but also people outside who come from completely different fields, so philosophy or political philosophy and economics uh, and law, and see what they have in, in language policy and see what they can offer. You know, if, if we tell them, well, this is our thing with translation policy, you know, what would be your take from your field? Uh, so, so we targeted the people we wanted in the book. That's why it's a bit thinner than most uh, than most uh, anthologies. It's intense. <laughs> it's intense. There you go. Uh, and um, to see, you know, what what they could bring to the table in terms of theory, but also of uh, of actual case studies. So I contributed a sort of a very mundane case study uh, about Brownsville, which is where yeah. I live. Um, but it's very different than anything I'd seen in Europe before. So. At least for me, it was very rewarding. Mm. Tell me about that. Tell me about mm. the Mexican border. So, Town. yeah. So I, I, I live in the border. Uh, and when I say the border, I mean the border because the border fence runs through campus. Um, so I park my car in front of the border fence, mm -hmm. you know, when I go on campus. Uh, and and there, it's a very unique place. Well, I don't know how unique it is, but I've never been anywhere like that before. Uh, so it's interesting to me. Because it's a place where Spanish speakers have been there for a long time and are demographically a majority, but the the official discourse is very much, you know, English, English, English. Uh, so you get this diglossic situation where the language of education is English and the language of all official business is English, um, but people in their houses speak either Spanish, and I'm overgeneralizing, right? But Spanish or will speak bilingually. So a lot of code switching and uh, and a lot of Spanglish and so forth. There's very few monolingual speakers of English uh, mm. where I live. So when in Europe you have, you know, in the UK and places like it, you have the government very much invested in language policy as a form of cultural policy. Mm. Uh, and so, and, and human rights concerns, and this is where the interpreters come in, you know, for refugees and things like that. There's none of that in Brownsville. Um, it's sort of the, you know, people do whatever they can uh, within the constraints that they have. And this is the de facto language policy that English is the language of official business. But I've been to say, um, these they'll call these public meetings, these public hearings, whenever they have to do something very important, they want input from uh, the, the citizens in, in, in Brownsville. And they'll hold the meeting in English, um, even if some of the speakers are speaking with an accent. Mm -hmm. But then when people get up and speak, some of them will speak in Spanish. Uh, but the response will always be in English. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, so you get this sort of dynamic. And then when you go, I, I started interviewing people that work for the, the provision of services uh, in government. And, um, you know, they'll be like, oh, but we don't, we don't need it language policy, a translation policy, because, you know, Maria and Sofia and so-and-so, they all speak Spanish. Um, and I said, well, do you check when you interview them? No, they just do, uh, because that's the demographic, right? You'll assume the only instance once somebody told me about language testing was that they tested them for English skills, uh, because they wanted to make sure that they spoke good English. Um, that's not true. There was one person who tested them for Spanish because she hired people whose Spanish wasn't as good, and they were picking up the phones all the time, and she saw that they were struggling. Okay. And she's like, I better need to check <laughs> when I hire people that they're very proficient in Spanish. But that's very different than what you see in Europe. Are you doing sort of straight social linguistics of a multilingual community? It, it, uh, I don't consider myself social linguist. No, no. <laughs> but, uh, no. but, uh, but yes, I mean, all these things come into play, and ideas of prestige and power, they're very present and very palpable. Uh, in the border, so it's it's a good place to be looking at these things. Yeah. So, what kind of research do you think we need in translation studies? Um, that's a, I I don't know, but I can think oh, the kind of research like see, I would yeah, like sure. to, uh, or, or maybe the kind of research I'd like to do, and that I think would be good if there was more of it. One of them is along these lines, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, Reina discovered for me, or opened for me, this world of translation policy, and I think it's a very rich world. Uh, so these type of studies that look at the way translation is used by institutions, by those in power, um, by those who are providing services, um, as sort of a way to deal with 
reality on the ground, yeah. multicultural reality. I, I think these type of studies are they're very meaningful to me, um, and and I'm seeing more and more of them come along. Uh, so um, I think there's value in you know literary translation studies, and that's sort of where we started with Bible studies and other things. But for me personally, I'm more interested in these studies that look at, for instance, um, you have a hospital that decides that for some reason it's deficient uh, in its language provision and what it does to fix that and whether that fix actually works, you know, and how translations are part of that. That kind of thing I think is very worthwhile. Um, and But I also like sort of the more academic, the history of translation kind of things where, you know, you, you want to, it, it's more you're sitting in a room with books or, you know, doing maybe archival work. Uh, but I think there's value in that as well because it helps us contextualize the way people have been talking to each other throughout history, uh, which isn't usually there in the history books. I'm working on a research project right now where I'm looking at how there's this guy in Uruguay, his name's Jose Pedro Varela. He's like the main, they call him El Padre de la Escuela because he was a huge reformer. There's education before him and after him. And he published a number of books that were very influential and you know, profound reforms to the educational system. Turns out most of the stuff... You're from you, Uruguay. Yes, I'm, already, I'm from Uruguay. That, did we? Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm from Uruguay, hence the interest in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went to school, and this guy's picture is in every single school, yeah. right on, on the patio where kids play. There's yeah. the guy's picture. Uh, and so I'm looking at the books he writes, and it turns out that a number of them were... <laughs> yeah, so I'm looking at the books he writes, and it turns out that a number of them were either full translations or partially translated. Uh, and it's interesting because so he... Into Spanish. Into Spanish. Oh. Because he came to the U.S. and he spent eight months here. And, uh, well, we're in Canada, but mm -hmm. in North America. Yeah. Uh, and he, he fell in love with the educational system. And he said, we need to do this there. So he bought all these books from Horace Mann, and all these different educators, uh, and took him home in crates. Uh, and then he started producing a number of articles that he was publishing in newspapers and in magazines and in books um, that are all coming from his material that he picked up when he was in the U.S. Um, and he said in one of his books, he says this. He says, look, I'm not a, 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 an educator, right? In the preface, he says, I'm not an educator. So this is the result of eight years of reading through the writings of North American educators. Um, and you can look at his books and you can see this comes from here and this comes from here and this comes from here. But nobody ever thinks of him as a translator. And if you talk to people in education, because I went there this last summer and I was talking to some educators about this, they're like, oh, that's really interesting. Uh, and so I think there's some value in okay. that as well. It's like you also did work on the constitutions yes. in South American countries that are actually translations from the American. From the American Constitution, yeah. yes. So, um, I mean, there's a secret history of translation. There is, very much so. Uh, and of course, Bastan has been doing a lot of work uh, with this. And um, But then I, I did some research also on not just the constitutions, but I said, well, they've done some of this, but what else were they translating in that period? And it turns out that I mean, they, these were all prolific translators. These were members of the elites that had spare time and, and the resources to do this, and they traveled to Europe and to the U.S., not to Spain, because Spain was not the model to follow at the time. Uh, so they were translating all these things, mainly from English and to some degree from French, um, and circulating them in books, you know, and, and in pamphlets, and, you know, things they do in their basement and, you know, spread out. So translation has been very much present all the time, but you would never know this from picking up a history book about Latin America. Okay, Gabriel, thank you very much. Oh, no, thank you.